Hello and welcome to the launch of this exhibition, Perfect Spaces, a look at the work of artist Ben Johnson, hosted virtually by the VNA in a space that's created by Make Architects. It certainly is a brave new world and a new way of looking at art. And I'd like to start this discussion today by handing over immediately to Ken Shuttleworth, the founder of Make Architects, to set the scene for us, uh, give us a bit of context um, and show us what we're going to be discussing today. Over to you, Ken. Thank you, Tamsi. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's so wonderful to be here and to be involved in this incredible exhibition of Ben's work. The concept for this new virtual gallery, the Volta Contemporary Art, or the VCA, was born out of, out of lockdown, where we couldn't actually go to real galleries. Um, you know, IRL, in real life, as my kids would say. So it proved, it evolved over the last uh, past year and has been more recently evolved with this exhibition with support and feedback from Ben Johnson and Chris Turner of the VNA. It's been delivered by a talented group of MAKE architects led by my partners, Greg Willis, who is here, and Jack Sargent. I'm absolutely delighted to be working with Ben Johnson, someone I've known for many, many years and admired for even more. And of course, we're delighted that the VNA wanted to collaborate with us and take the VCA gallery for this fabulous event. So here is a brief preview. Please run the VT. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, um, and thanks for showing us that. So today's event is going to last um, about an hour. Um, just to let everyone know, it is a recorded event, so you will be able to go back and, and watch it again, should you desire. Um, and there will be an opportunity for Q&A from you, the audience, um, towards the end of the discussion. So please do um, share any questions you have in the Q&A box, and we'll be referring to those throughout our discussion. Um, now, today to have this discussion about this um, amazing project in more depth, I'm really delighted to say that we're joined um, by the artist himself, uh, Ben Johnson, um, whose exquisite work is obviously the, uh, the whole subject um, of today um, and of this work in its entirety. Um, but also the team who made the project possible, we're joined by uh, the curator, uh, Chris Turner, who's Keeper of Architecture, Design and Photography at the VNA. Um, which I think is a fabulous job title. I'd like to be the keeper of something. Um, Carty Price, who's head of digital media and publishing um, at the VNA, um, and also Greg Willis uh, from Make, who of course designed and built this virtual space um, for the exhibition. So, Chris, I'd, I'd like to start um, with you really, and to ask how this project came about, and and really what it's like to curate an exhibition that's going to be viewed in this way. Um, and maybe you could explore just a little bit about why Ben, what, why, why you decided to try this with Ben. Um, well, uh, thank you everyone for coming and you know, delighted that this is about to launch this exhibition. Um, uh, this really started with Ben's work. Um, the first painting I saw of Ben's was his portrait of Norman Foster's Willis Faber building in Ipswich. And it was at the Superstructures exhibition at the Sainsbury Centre in Norwich, um, a celebration of high tech, uh, the movement with which Ben is most associated. And the painting, which shows the ground floor swimming pool in the Willis Faber building, um, was, you know, it totally captivated me. 
Um, it was full of glamour and geometry and captured something of the generosity that Norman Foster sought to inject into his building by blurring work and leisure in this way. And um, thinking of our own architecture gallery and how to represent high tech in a new way, the spirit of high tech rather than the models and the plans, I greedily wanted to acquire this beautiful painting. And um, it turned out that Reba already owned it. So because of the architecture partnership, it was already in the building. But the resulting studio visit uh, with Ben in his West London studio was a total inspiration. Because as you'll see here, Ben talks so articulately about the buildings that inspire him. He has a real empathy for architecture. Um, in his own description, his paintings celebrate everything that he thinks is great in architecture and engineering. Not the ego of the architect, but the ambitions of architecture. And I think they really do that. Um, ben had done a public performance in Liverpool. Uh, the canvas is, is uh, on show here in the Vault of Contemporary Art. He painted a monumental cityscape in the museum. And before COVID killed this idea, we had hoped to emulate that at the V&A and imagine that he would bring his studio into the museum for the entirety of June to coincide with the London Festival of Architecture. Um, you know, when I went to visit him in his studio, I discovered that Ben studied at the Royal College of Art in the 60s when it was based at the museum. And the V&A really inspired his work. You know, he said incredibly flattering things about the museum. And you can really see it in his canvases. You know, especially the influence of Owen Jones in his Alhambra series. You know, Ben still comes to the V&A to consult those works which inform his paintings. He's like traveling in the footsteps of these, these wonderful 19th century uh, artists. Um, and as you'll see behind him in the, you know, behind Ben now, his studio is crammed with paintings that tell the history of architecture from his unique perspective. And the question was how to bring some of that to the museum without you know, cramming the architecture landing with canvases, um, which Ben actually wanted to do, but proved incredibly hard and quite dangerous. Um, so that's where Mate came in with the Vault of Contemporary Art, this, this very innovative platform that's one of the most exciting responses, I think, to the lockdown problem. Endless galleries have been experimenting with open studios and artist films. And this is a really important contribution uh, to that, that line of thinking. Um, it's a series of 12 pavilions that for this exhibition, we chose to land in the V&A, almost like a UFO. We wanted to give it the context of the, the V&A to show this affiliation, that it is a V&A exhibition. And I think that works quite well, tethering it at the heart of the museum. Um, with this display, I wanted to keep things very simple. I find with a lot of interactive platforms that are all bells and whistles, they're very distracting. I thought that would be slightly disrespectful to Ben's work. I want people to engage with it uh, more closely. Um, but by positioning a painting in one of these pavilions, uh, you know, we were able to give his work that respect, but also to juxtapose the paintings with films of Ben talking about the paintings and the buildings that have inspired him. And I think you'd seldom see that in an exhibition. It would be seen as slightly philistine to have a, you know, a, a TV screen as large as the canvas, uh, which is being discussed. But I think in this virtual world, it works really well. Um, you know, in a, in a gallery, you'd probably more likely have an audio guide, but seeing Ben talking about these works in a series of films that Tapio Snellman shot around the V&A, um, which show these kind of synergies between our collections and the canvases Ben paints is really interesting, I think. Um, one of the other advantages was that virtual space is elastic. So the visitor can open doors and sort of tumble into spaces uh, that you wouldn't be able to in a, in a museum. So you can go into his studio, for example, and have the kind of behind the scenes tour that I had a tremendous privilege to have when I first went to see Ben and to listen to him. And I think we've kind of recreated some of that privileged access here. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. I think, I think, I think you were absolutely right. I think particularly in landing it in the context of the VA makes it feel um, more like an exhibition, like a physical um, space. It, is, it has that connotation rather than you're entering a completely fabricated world. And it's, to me, there feels like an interesting tension between that landing it in the physical space and of course being um, in that virtual world. 
I just wondered if there was anything particularly about Ben's work that you thought lent to that, that juxtaposition of the virtual and the real. Well, in the 1980s, um, Ben studied at, um, he, at Central St. Martins. He was a postgraduate student, I think it was Central St. Martins, the first computer graphics course in Britain. And his paintings, which are composed from numerous drawings, mix these traditional methods with digital technology. And therefore, I think they lend themselves really well to virtual display. You know, in their crystalline perfection, they have some of the quality of digital imagery. And I don't mean that in any insulting way. I think they're, 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 they're amazing. Um, the paintings are sort of celebrations of structure, but they're also objects of meditation. And the single point perspective that Ben uses to capture what he calls the magnetic point of a building, the place where you take in the, the entirety of the architecture as a powerful image and are touched emotionally, um, are captured using sometimes impossible perspectives that are only available to us uh, from a computer. Um, and he often uses technology to recreate buildings that no longer exist. For example, Crystal Palace. And in that painting, he explores how Joseph Paxton uses complementary color to create vibrant effects that almost have a digital glow. Um, sometimes um, in some of Ben's work, another one that's on display here uh, of Richard Rogers' Inmos microprocessor factory, he's revisited it and discovered that some of these social generous spaces that Rogers imagined within the buildings have become cluttered and compromised. And he's gone back and painted a picture that corrects this. And he thinks of those as records of the perfect spaces that the architects uh, imagined. And that's why the exhibition is called Perfect Spaces, because his paintings are perfect. Um, and in a way, I think the pixelated digital world is also a perfect world. So there's that kind of vibration there. You know, the world of video game utopias and, and illuminated worlds is also perfect. Um, so, you know, I think, I think, you know, his works particularly lend themselves to this form of, of, of digital display. Yeah, sort of layers upon layers there, isn't there? Yeah, and that's the brilliant thing about the vault of contemporary art. You can really layer meaning, um, add all sorts of things that would, you know, clutter a, a museum label. Yeah, absolutely. So, Ben, we've been, <laughs> been talking about you. Um, we're delighted you're able to join us here today. And your work is undoubtedly architectural and content, as, as Chris has so eloquently um, outlined. And I'm really fascinated generally about how we represent these different, different architectural spaces and forms in different mediums. So I wonder um, if you could tell us a little bit about what draws you initially to your subjects and then how your process enables you to kind of reinterpret these 3D uh, spaces into these amazing, essentially 2D images. Tamsi, thank you very much. And um, Chris, thank you for those kind words. It's great for us all to be gather, together as a team because we have been a team. Make have been fantastic. The V&A has been wonderful with Chris and he's kept me um, under control. So great to be together. My making of paintings, the one thing I would question is when Chris uses the words a portrait of a building. One of the things I'm trying never to do is make a portrait or an illustration of, build, of a building, but I want to represent the essence of what I have discovered within that built form. I have chosen architecture because I knew I wanted to be a figurative, a realist painter. I wanted people to understand what they were looking at but I wanted the subject to be very important and much more important than I am. And in fact, through this exhibition, this virtual exhibition, I've had the opportunity of making a recording of just about a minute with each painting, which talks about my motivation. Now, I've talked very little about my artistic ambitions, but only my ambitions as an individual. And what I feel is that I'm lucky enough to have the time, space, and the ability to spend all day making mud pies, getting my hands dirty, putting paint on the surface. I see my painting 
as a process of meditation, and I see the paintings as being a concentration of my inspiration. How I choose my buildings is sometimes quite random, that I accidentally stumble across things. But of course, there is never an accident. We are often led to places because we need to be led to those places. And there are certain architects who I have pursued and they have continued to satisfy me. But the one thing that is driving me always is the message that comes through the building. And that message is one of integrity, social awareness, commitment and passion and respect for the users of the building. So my paintings are a celebration of a social activity and an incredibly worthwhile activity. It's the activity of making, building, representing, enriching people's lives. Does that help? Mute. You're muted, Tansy. Yeah. I've got loads of messages on my screen. Is it gone? Yes. Um, sorry, no, it absolutely helps. And I think for me, it's the, um, the phrase that really stuck is that celebration of social activity, um, the, making, the making of the space and the representation of the space. And I wondered how you felt that translated into the making of this virtual space uh, to, hold, to hold your celebration of, a, of another making of space and how as an artist you go about preparing um, for an exhibition that's going to be curated and experienced in this way and sort of both a 3D space that people can walk around, albeit through this, this 2D screen. Right, well, this is a completely new experience. There was no way that I could prepare for this because I had to be led by Chris <laughs> with his ambitions as the curator and then this wonderful team at MAKE who had the ability to help us to realize our, our ambitions. For me, this is not the exhibition we were originally planning. It's a wonderful alternative. And this is going to be a necessity for many of us in the future. And with more and more paintings flooding the world, more and more artists flooding the world, um, we're not going to have enough gallery spaces, but also, a film like this can introduce people to something they may not previously have known. And also, I'm hoping that my conversations through Tapio's films will help people to understand my motivation and therefore get a better understanding of what might drive an artist. I always say that really artists should be seen and not heard, so I've broken my own golden rule, because most artists express themselves very badly through words, but wonderfully, you know, their means of communication is usually painting, sculpture, whatever. But all of this is going to change, and in the next few years, when the virtual platform becomes much more accessible, ordinary, and um, extraordinary, because we're going to learn as we go along, there are going to be artists who will be making work from the very beginning with the idea of it only being seen virtually. This will be a whole new way of presentation. Like it, loathe it, it's there. We've got to embrace it, celebrate it again, and push the boundaries. Um, we've learned so much over the last few months and I think if we did this exhibition in a year's time, we might approach it differently again. And technology may have moved. And I think that um, Greg and his team have really pushed the boundaries and uh, have taken risks and chances. And along with Tapio's films, which I find very enlightening, um, it's been a wonderful experience, but a brand new experience and one which I would like to continue but maybe with just dealing with one painting at a time. Chris has called this very generously um, 
a retrospective, but it is only 10 paintings that represent 50 years of my output, output and my commitment to the world of architecture. I'm very interested in, in what you just said, and I just wonder if I could ask just a sort of final follow-up point on that, which was how you think the lessons you've learned through this process might inform how you generate any, any paintings or studies that you do going forward with a, a, a view to them or a mindset that they may be uh, displayed in this way? Yes, well, um, I'm, I'm deeply rooted in the craft of painting. I, can't, I can hardly spend a day without putting a mark down on paper or a blob of paint on a surface. I am not going to enter the world of the virtual. However, over the last 50 years, I have consistently sold paintings and often straight from my studio and they've gone into private collections where they're not seen by anybody. This could be a way of me sharing my work as long as the collector was prepared to have it shared. So this gives me an element of hope that my painting is not going to be seen by a very small handful of people. So that's one possibility. The other thing that this has opened up is the whole questioning of scale, because we had a very interesting decision to make at the beginning. The vaults, pavilions, the 12 galleries are all approximately 10 meters by 10 meters by 10 meters. The obvious thing is that you blow the painting up to be as large as possible. And we made a decision that no, we would put it in a correct scale. I'm not sure if that's going to work, but that's very important because every artist doesn't work in a, a conceptual way. Most artists work with parameters, guides, and the uh, mindfulness of physicality. So, it may make me think about the possibilities of making larger works that are only to be seen virtually. Um, but at the moment, I'm not throwing my brushes, my spray guns or my paints away. That's where I'm rooted. Feel very much in real life then. I'm a realist. <laughs> so, Greg, if I could move to you. Um, I'm really interested to know a little bit more about all the technology that underpins um, everything we've been talking about in the, the short video that we, um, we've seen. Could you just tell us a little bit about what the VCA actually is and what the technology is that's supporting it? Uh, thanks, Nancy. Well, the, the VCA stands for the Vault of Contemporary Art. And the idea from the very outset was that a vault contains special things. Uh, and it's completely secure. And so in, in the same way, that's what this is. But because it's virtual, it allows us to really subvert those ideas of what a vault is. So we can introduce daylight, we can introduce a sense of materiality, we can introduce outside space. And also touching up actually on what, uh, uh, what Ben alluded to there, the other thing that is different from a normal vault is that it is completely accessible. Uh, and that really intrigued us. And that's, they're the things that can like driven our decisions on how we create this digitally. Um, from the outset, we wanted to have a sense of space. That's what we that's what we do as architects. That's our that's our day job. And so, you know, a virtual environment could be anywhere. It could be inside somebody's brain. It could be on the moon. But we did want to ground it in things that we understood and have been trained in. So materiality, um, lighting. Uh, scale, hierarchy, sense of a journey. Um, and so all of those things led us to uh, take the approach of just using the same tools and techniques that we do on our, on our day job. And so we approached this as a normal project. It had a brief, it had a client. Uh, we started with sketches. Uh, we then built models. They were at scale. Um, we then created a three-dimensional model in a computer. We use Studio Max for most of our renderings and Unreal for the animation. And that's all at one-to-one, -one, which is fantastic, you know, because we, we build it at one-to-one -one scale. Uh, normally it gets built at one-to-one, -one. this time it just happens to stay within the confines of the computer. Um, but then 
the interesting thing is then adding another layer, which is the platform, which is the usability. Um, and that then introduced a, a number of key aspects of this project with us, which is not only a sense of space that we wanted to be created, but a real sense of the artist. So just like Chris, I was blown away when I first got to meet Ben in his studio. It was just the most amazing experience walking around this place, seeing the work in progress, listening to Ben Toys. Um, and I, we just came away thinking, how can we portray some of this? Because if, if we can do that, we, we, we fully acknowledge that we'll miss going to a gallery what we did during lockdown and being next to an actual artifact was irreplaceable. But what this can do is layer narrative uh, in such a really interesting and accessible way. So that then led us to a platform that we use in KR Pano, which allows us to use sound, it allows us to use videos, it allows us to layer in um, uh, navigable tools like, uh, like you would have on Google Earth, um, uh, bring in text um, and have this multi-dimensional framework uh, for really exploring all of the stories behind these, uh, these wonderful pieces, which have to be the start. Um, so we're so grateful that we get to ground it in the V&A and have that sense of base. And we're so grateful that we had access to all of Ben's work, not only these 10 pieces, but his time in making the videos with Tapio, um, and a myriad of sketchbooks and photography um, and all of the support, uh, his support infrastructure that goes behind his, uh, his day job, as he, as he refers to it, although of course it's so much more. Thanks, Greg. I'm, I'm just interested, if you don't mind, just um, I guess exploring a little bit about what it's like being an architect creating that kind of virtual space rather than a, a, real, a real life space. Um, and how you kind of consider the user um, and how the sort of differentials in considering the user in this um, project rather than the sort of the, the average make project, project. Yes, well, I suppose like all buildings, when you're finished and you're finished snagging and you open the doors, then uh, you let people in and they have a look. Um, so that nothing is too dissimilar there. Um, and also actually in the process as well, we were, we were very uh, key to make sure we, we retained that critical element. So we still had pinups, um, we still put things on the wall, we still made scale models, we still um, had meetings with, with Chris um, and with Ben and kind of like discuss things as if it was going to be built. And I think that's the real key. We've experienced lots of virtual um, displays over the over the course of the last year and a half we've spent most of our time there and sometimes it's just not a very pleasant um, experience um, and sometimes it's because it's so far removed from reality and so what we wanted to do was try to make something that could be built um, uh, so Chris it's an invitation to you if you would like us to build the pavilions then 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 do let us know. Uh, but obviously, um, short of a, a decent roof uh, and some waterproofing details, this could be built. And I think that's really important in um, appreciating art and Ben's pieces in particular. Thank you, Greg. I think that's probably something we'll come back to um, in what you just said. But I'd like to move on um, now to Carti, um, who could perhaps set this project for us in a little bit of a, a, a wider context. Um, and how, I suppose, what the impact lockdown has had on the VNA um, in terms of its digital offer, um, and how projects like this have, have maybe been um, an example of the organisation having to innovate and, and what those challenges might might have been. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tamsi. Um, I think you know the, the overall challenge for us was that the VNA, everything about the VNA, is so based on and predicated on this incredible physical experience from being in the buildings themselves to being around the, the objects in our galleries to coming to incredible exhibitions that are immersive experiences themselves. So we, like many other organisations, face quite a challenge in thinking about what this new world presented to us. Um, but fortunately, we were always, we were always mindful of what the, the digital context is and what the 
digital technologies present to us in terms of how we get um, the stories of our the collections and the, the objects within the collections out to a global audience. And so um, it, it presented an opportunity to showcase some of the great content we already produce, the ways we use our exhibitions, our galleries, our objects as sort of springboards to tell bigger stories about the history of, of 5,000 years of human creativity. And so we were thinking alongside many others in the sector about how we might replicate physical experiences through virtual tours, etc. You saw a big rise um, at the beginning of the first lockdown in, in terms of lots of organisations doing virtual tours from Frida Kahlo's Blue House to the British Museum to NASA headquarters. You could go into those spaces and there was a real appetite at the beginning of the first lockdown for that kind of experience. Um, and even if you look at Google Trends, you can see that this sort of this trend did decrease because people were looking for something more. They were looking for something more in terms of connection with stories and experiences that didn't just um, look at virtual forms of um, physical experience. They didn't just look for digital surrogates of physical experiences. Actually, they were looking for something more experientially and more socially. And that's why this presents a really interesting um, hint at what the future might look like in that um, we're thinking not just about um, physical space and telling stories about Ben's incredible art within that space, but thinking about how to weave storytelling, um, as Ben's described through films, etc., in a more um, integrated way and think about how we can challenge the physical constraints of the building to um, create a space to showcase this creativity in a way that we just simply couldn't do in the physical space. So I think it really points to what the future might look like in terms of us seeing physical spaces as a, a starting point for an experience, but the, the digital realm offers us this way to scale that up and to think about digital technologies in ways that can add layer and meaning and a sense of scale and interactivity that simply can't be done in, in physical spaces. So is your prediction that this is a sort of lasting trend that will continue to be part of the v offer or perhaps expand to be a larger part of the, the v offer going forward? Absolutely. I think we're always conscious that um, there's a limit to how many people, particularly now, can actually come to uh, the physical museum and lots of people because of lockdown and for other reasons are not going to be able to come through our doors. And so we're, we've always been very conscious of the need to serve a global audience. Um, it's part of our public purpose in terms of providing access to our collections, the knowledge we hold on those collections, the stories we tell about those collections. So I think that's always been front of mind. Our digital audience is always far bigger and will continue to be far bigger than the people who can physically attend the museum. So how can we continue to create uh, stories and digital products and content experiences for those people, um, as well as for those who do come, how can we create a complementarity between what they see in a physical space and what they might encounter online or in virtual spaces. So it absolutely points to the, the future direction, but what's so important about this is the rigor with which this experience has been created. Um, and as an institution that is, um, you know, showcases human ingenuity and the creative process itself. It's so important that that's such an integral part of what we've done here, that using Ben's process and creativity as the starting point to look at how that then could sit in a physical space. And, and the rigor and quality of that thinking is far beyond um, the sorts of tours we were seeing at the beginning of lockdown, which was simply 360 degree walkthroughs of a physical space, which feels like it's sort of lacking something. And I think we've all as institutions learned so much about what, what people need. And you were talking about users of space and that's so important that informs all the content we produce all the digital experiences we create. It's so important that we're basing that on genuine human need and interest and people are craving social experiences. Um, and how can we move these spaces into a territory that explores what social connections look like in those spaces. So I, I can only see that evolving more. Um, and as an aside, we saw a big sort of change in the different lockdowns around what people were craving. And I think we saw like this, like an experience spectrum of people looking for trivial lighthearted things. So we have online interactives like design a wig where people can Create, recreate Marie Antoinette's um, incredible uh, wigs and adorn them. Um, and people love stuff like that. It was a distraction at a really stressful time. Um, 
But at the same time, we saw a massive increase in really deep engagement with things like um, some online interactives we created for our Raphael cartoons, which allow people to really zoom into the incredible detail of the of the paintings, the preparatory paintings for the, for the tapestries you can see in the Vatican. Um, and that they're more scholarly in their intent, and they still draw on different sort of experience dynamics of playfulness and interaction. But they, were, they served a very different audience need, and I think it's really important to accommodate that sort of whole spectrum when you're thinking about what what we need to provide for our audiences in terms of serving a, a quite a wide spectrum of need. Thank you, absolutely. I'm certainly going to look at that wig. <laughs> app. I haven't found that one, so that sounds like hours of fun. Um, I wanted to sort of open the discussion up a little bit, um, and there's certainly an opportunity now if there's anyone in the audience who would like to raise a question, please um, type it into the, the Q&A bar. Um, but if I may, I'd like to start by picking up on something that uh, Greg said actually around scale and how you how you scale um, uh, an event like this. How, how do you create it into a, a physical thing and decide what the dimensions are for that? Um, I'd be interested to hear uh, Greg's views as the architect, but also maybe Chris as, as the curator. Um, I don't know if you want to start, Chris, from that perspective. Give us some thoughts. Well, in terms of in terms of scale, um, we couldn't have built a pavilion like this in the uh, the garden of the V and A uh, for the London Festival of Architecture. So we had this luxury of being able to create this vast structure. It's almost like the Louisiana Museum um, in in terms of being a series of pavilions that you can navigate and walk around in this circular arrangement. And it's set within a forest. You know, at the moment for the London Design Biennale, as Devlin's built a forest in Somerset House, we've got a forest here too, a, a virtual forest. Um, I think it's it's also the London Festival of Architecture, not only uh, Ben's building, uh, Ben's uh, paintings about architecture, but also architects work initially in these kind of virtual worlds. You know, these digital fly-throughs are the bread and butter of architecture. You know, that's how a client experiences a building way before it's built. Um, so I think it was sort of appropriate that um, using this, this uh, luxury of time we had in lockdown, that uh, Make was able to, you know, build these series of pavilions uh, and create this exhibition. It's probably, it must be said, it's probably taken about as long uh, to do this is to put on a real exhibition <laughs> and thank you to Greg and his team at Make for all the hours that went into it but it really was a laborious process um, finessing this technology. Um, you know Ben spoke a little bit about the scale of his canvases and I think it you know we chose not to blow them up so that they filled the entirety of the wall to give it that certain scale and I think they do look sort of jewel-like in this space so I I think that was the, the the correct thing to do. Anyway, over to you, Greg. Yeah, no, thanks, Chris. I, I think um, scale is obviously incredibly important to us. But what, as, as I said, we, we always design at one-to-one -one scale, although we're thinking at different scales in terms of representation. But what's was fascinating about this process is that we got to design and work at the same time uh, with the curator, with Chris, and with the artist, with Ben. So we're, previously, we, we kind of very much front end. Um, but then, so to the whole question about what size should the pieces be in the gallery and therefore what should the dimensions of the gallery be around those pieces was really fascinating. Um, and of course, it just, it broadened out to much more than just the physical dimensions. So it became a conversation about the colours of the walls. So how we can, if we are kind of have them at one to one, how can we further make them jewel like? So do the walls need to be darker? If they're darker, therefore we need to up the lighting. Um, and then if they are at the right scale, what level should they be at relative to the camera view? And of course, the camera view is your eye view. So it became a, a, a holistic discussion about all of the things, all of the parameters that were available to us, all the slide bars in our, in our uh, toolbox, uh, lighting, materiality, um, height of the camera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was great. Oh, I seem to have lost Greg. Is that the same for everybody else? Yes. 
So I'm going to I'm going to move on <laughs> to, to my next question, um, if that's OK. Um, and I was really interested in something that Carty said, and it was also very much in um, Ben's answers to questions around craft. And of course, the V&A has this, you know, this reputation for physical objects and craft and the care and the attention um, that goes into them. And, you know, it goes without saying that's evident and obvious in all of Ben's work. Um, and I was just interested in getting reflections from uh, the two of you on then how that becomes represented, how you get the kind of essence of that, the, the feeling of the, the fingerprint almost um, in this uh, sort of virtual world. Ben, I don't know if you could start for us. Yes, I, I think that that was a real problem. And um, I, I've described the B&A as being my tutor and the very reason that for 50 years I painted. I fell in love with craftsmanship and the making and the enthusiasm of makers. And it's all physically based, whether it's ceramics, cloth, painting, sculpture, etc. cetera. Um, in this exhibition, I think if we hadn't had the virtual tours around the studio where you can see the detritus of daily life, um, if we hadn't had such good filmmaker who homed in on color samples, we would have lost that because when we go into the galleries, there is a very clean, beautifully presented image of a painting, but it's an image. It's an image without history. What the films do and what the visits to the studio, the, there are two galleries, one given over to process and one to two of my studios. And what those do is they bring back the balance that these are the byproduct of craft, manipulation and the handling of raw material. Thank you. Carty, how do you how do you feel this this works for a, a museum and institution that's so based on craft? Um, it's it, I think digital technology presents an opportunity to do just that to, um, for example, be able to zoom into objects to really understand the process. So I mentioned the Raphael cartoons by creating deep zoom and by which I mean sort of gigapixel style deep zoom into um, the way the paper has been stitched together help you understand how Raphael or his studio could have been operating, creating these, these giant canvases at that sort of scale. Or in terms of ceramics, being able to zoom into, you know, the, the, the fingerprint that's still left on a pot. Um, but some objects are sort of quite static in their nature and when they're put in a museum environment, they, they aren't shown when they're in use. For example, fashion is, is really difficult to, to, to display because it's, it's designed to be worn and designed to be seen in motion. And so that's where using um, digital content as a layer, as a storytelling layer that can sit alongside the objects themselves to help bring them to life to give that sort of context can really help and that could be as simple as something like film but also using technologies old technologies such as x-ray where for example we 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 tell stories online around balenciaga the fashion designer but also include some of the x-ray imagery so you can see actually the structure that lies in you know that's that's that, um, underpins these incredible structural dresses um, and they're not able to be seen by the naked eye but they help you understand exactly why and how Balenciaga was such a genius in terms of how he created these sculptural forms so I think it's about seeing things in the round and seeing digital technologies as a layer of storytelling but using those technologies also to help show some of that creative process and, and bring it to to the fore. Thank you I actually just wanted to pick up on something that you said, but also Ben and Chris have all alluded to, and I want to sort of direct this question maybe to, to Chris and, and to yourself, Carty, about the more personal and the connections and the behind the scenes and the access and this sort of extra layer of experience that the, the virtual gives you. And I know Chris and I previously had conversations about the curation of architectural exhibitions and, and generally the limitations that traditional forms um, set on, on curators. I just wonder if we get some reflections from you on, on what this kind of means for the VNA um, and how you might explore that further. I don't know, Chris, you want to, to go first? 
Um, well, in our architecture gallery, we do have audio experiences. No one picks them up at all. You know, I don't think anyone knows they're there. They're sort of disguised almost in the cases. Um, and, you know, it is, you know, what, what is important about these buildings is their social spaces. And I think that's what Ben has brought to life here. And people might not recognize that when they see his paintings initially, uh, because they're devoid of people. Um, and he's deliberately chosen not to include people in his paintings because that would date them. You know, if you saw someone, you know, he's, or he said wearing flared trousers like you see in a Hockney painting, you know you're in the 1970s. Um, but all his paintings commemorate social places. And I think you can feel that when you look at them, that they're gregarious spaces. Um, and, you know, they're, they're timeless, perfect spaces as well. And they're very much in the tradition of the Renaissance paintings of the ideal city. And I think that that comes through in this assembly of works that you see here. And to hear Ben talking about these buildings and the generosity behind their intent um, is really inspiring. And I think that's something that an architecture gallery or an architecture exhibition needs to convey. And, you know, it's done quite successfully here, I think. Thank you. Carti, what do you think that sort of means more broadly for the V&A and, and for other museums? Can you expand, Tamsi? I lost the sense of the, the question. I was very interested in the <laughs> this was raising and I, I, I drifted away from the original question. Just this idea that um, in, in the example that we're looking at today, this perfect space exhibition, there's the bizarre behind the scenes tour mm. of the, um, the artist's studio. You can hear the artist speak. Um, and the scale at which that's represented is, you know, on a part of the arts works themselves and how people, um, I guess, how this technology in the future might enable people to have that more personal interaction, both with the artwork, but also with the artist or the craftsperson, um, mm -hmm. how that might be, I suppose, more fully exploited um, and used by museums in the future. Um I think, I mean, if we're talking about the present, there are sort of really simple techniques that can do that. And film content is a brilliant way to do that sort of behind the scenes kind of take on, you know, what those stories about process and creativity look like, what they entail. And I think, you know, for us, some of our best performing online content was around a series we did about ASMR in the museum, which is, for those who don't know, is autosensory meridian response, which is certain pe people who have it uh, get a tingling sensation when they hear certain sounds. And we, we did a series commissioning an artist called Julie Rose Bauer to go into our archives to um, create these ASMR experiences that were sound led, that were about how we've conserved, for example, a, a clown costume. And that proved to be really incredibly popular content because it gave people that sense, A, of being behind the scenes, but also a very sensory experience through something as simple a format as, as film. But obviously with the rise of, of technology, exploring multi-sensory experience, things like VR, there's an amazing opportunity there to think about what multi-sensory experiences look like in the future. And we've started to explore what that might be for our current Alice in Wonderland exhibition where we've created an, a VR experience that takes you down the rabbit hole um, to play a game of hedgehog croquet, but you get this very visceral sense of shrinking um, once you drink the drink me bottle and expanding again, growing uh, once you eat a mushroom. I'll leave it there without going to the whole experience because I don't want to spoil it for those who are going to come to the exhibition and see. But it was a really interesting experiment to see what virtual technology might offer in terms of that, that sensory experience, one that similarly um, plays with ideas of scale and interaction. Thank you. Um, and I'm aware we're, we're running uh, close to time, but I just wanted to wrap up um, some of the themes that are coming out in the, the kind of Q&A in the, the chat, um, particularly to Ben and and to Greg around um, something that I actually wrote down three times as I was listening to different people speak um, about Ben's work and that's his empathy for architecture um, and how Ben's, what well, I can't put it any better than saying has this empathy for architecture, this kind of reverence of these spaces and celebrates them um, in this way. Um, and I was interested to hear from Ben a little bit more about um, about that experience and how you, you sort of represent um, that how, how the feel those paintings have the essence of representing um, those buildings and then how that translates into this digital world 
um, and maybe we start with Ben, but then move on to Greg and maybe we could hear a little bit about the VCA and how it might change and evolve depending on uh, artists that you're working with and, and the, I guess the empathy of the architecture that you're creating to the artist's work. Maybe we could start with Ben. Right, well, I have an obsession with architecture and it's because I have an obsession with people that reach out and bring disparate elements together to create something beautiful, possibly something functional, um, but essentially people that want to leave something behind them that helps to improve other people's lives. I also have enormous faith in the fact that everybody is naturally creative. And it's one of the things that's come out of many of the lockdowns, whether it's bread making, dress making, sewing, people want to make. And I think that it's a wonderful balance to the people that unfortunately want to break. So I support all makers and I am passionate about making and my making within my own studio is about me putting my feet on the ground and the world of architecture has offered me a subject matter which has become an object of meditation for me to represent yet another object of meditation. Thank you, Ben. Greg, how, how do you respond to that as a, I guess, as an architect and also as a person that's creating the space to show this, this work? Well, I think, um, as Ben himself said, he's a realist and uh, it, it's all, for us, we like making possible things. So we, we, we're not, in, in, our, in our architecture, we want to produce things. We don't want it just to end with the sketch. We want it to put it out there. And, you know, this wouldn't have been possible five years ago. The technology wasn't available to us. And so we think technology will just increase and there'll be new ways of telling stories. There will be new ways of exploring space and new possibilities that we'll be able to grasp, not only in helping us inform our architecture, um, but also I think potentially with the VCA as well. So I think it's been wonderful working with Ben because he's, he is grounded in realism. He, you know, everything he goes to to create a, a painting, it's only if it's possible, if he can get that level of geometry, if he can get that level of detail, um, he doesn't rely on anything other than what's at his fingertips. And that's the same for us. We, we're relying on what's at our fingertips. Now that's expanding and that's growing. And so as the possibility increases, then hopefully there'll be greater possibility uh, for telling more stories. But I think underpinning all of this is and, and and i we started off with this and at the end of the process we come back to it it's about that first conversation with the artist and hopefully the curator and saying what is this about and then we find the tools and the best way to uh put that on display for people and the exciting thing about this is for as many people as possible thank you greg um I'm going to call, draw the panel discussion uh, to an end there and to, to thank you all for contributing uh, to Christopher Turner, Ben Johnson, Carter Price and to Greg. But um, I'm going to actually hand over now uh, to Greg, who's going to show us a little bit more of the space and uh, talk us through um, how it can be used. Um, so over to you, Greg. Great. Well, thank you very much, Tamsi. So um, obviously we've been talking a lot about this experience. So what I wanted to show now is just a very short walkthrough of what some of the spaces are like and what's available uh, to people as they explore the VCA and Ben's exhibition in particular. So it's hosted on a website. There'll be a URL in, the, in a moment. Um, but you arrive in the courtyard of the VA, and this is where we have rooted and grounded our 12 pavilions in this central courtyard space. So you're invited to um, enter into those pavilions. 
um, where you can move around. Uh, each pavilion is accompanied with a fantastic video with Ben's voice explaining about that artwork, as well as lots of other clickable data that you would normally find in a, in a gallery uh, that gives you more information. And then these pieces are on the wall, but they also can be seen in high definition, so you can move over them and, and really take your time. There's lots of ways of navigating around the VCA, and then there's lots of interesting things like this one. This is the studio room where we've recreated through uh, 360 degree photography uh, Ben's two studios. So very much in an Alice in Wonderland kind of way. You shrink down, you can go into the studios, and then there's lots of other little interesting clickable hidden items to really get to grips with what goes underneath, what underpins uh, this incredible work um, on display in the first exhibition at the VCA. Okay. Thanks, Greg. That's, it's amazing to get to this point um, so quickly, to be honest. And, and Ben, just awesome paintings, absolutely fantastic. And I think it was just a brilliant and fascinating discussion. I'd like to echo Tamsi's words and say a heartfelt thank you to everybody, especially Ben, for having the faith in Make to create the right architecture for his very significant, uh, ins inspira you know, inspirational body of work. And to Chris for his guidance, curation, and total immersion in the concept. And also the late to thank, thank the rest of the v &A team and the Make Architectural team as well. I'd also like to thank Dara Hearn and Laura Ilioni, who, without whom it simply wouldn't have happened. So now it gives me great pleasure and pride to officially launch, like a bit like the Queen with a virtual bottle of champagne, in this case, uh, a ship, to launch the VCA Gallery. And I hope you enjoy exploring the virtual gallery as much as we did creating it. So thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. And please do get in touch via the VCA website directly to make or more for more information. So very good evening to everybody and thank you again. And thank you to everybody for attending and thank you again for all the panelists for a fantastic evening. Thank you. <laughs>